Hi guys, thanks for tuning in to another video on Forgotten Weapons. I'm Ian, I'm here today at the Rock Island Auction House taking a look at some of the guns that are coming up for sale in their September of 2015 premiere auction. And one of the guns they have is this particular thing, which probably has a whole lot more history than you might expect to it. This is an 1879 Remington Lee rifle. Now what makes this particularly noteworthy is that it's the first really successful rifle uh, developed by James Paris Lee. Now, Mr. Lee was uh, by birth a Scot. When he was five years old in 1836, his family emigrated to Canada, and then by 1859 he found himself, now an adult, living in Wisconsin in the U.S., tinkering and inventing, and 1860 he produced his first firearms patent. He was trying to make a 40-shot repeating rifle. I don't have any details on that, and that's not directly relevant to this story. But from 1860 until 1879, he was working pretty much all the time on trying to develop firearms technology. One of the problems he had run into was the use of a tube magazine with even round, early round nose bullets. You had this risk of cartridges detonating in the magazine from recoil. And that's a bad thing, obviously. In his attempts to get around this tube magazine problem, what he ended up doing was inventing the detachable box magazine, which is now ubiquitous on virtually every type of firearm we use. So when Lee invented this magazine, he actually had some existing ties to the Remington company. He developed a carbine during the Civil War. Remington had produced the barrels for him. It seemed like natural that he would go to the Remington company with this new patent to develop his rifle. In fact, he didn't. At the time, Remington was rather invested in the Remington Keen rifle, which was a tube magazine gun, actually, for U.S. military trials. Well, this was specifically designed to avoid the tube magazine, and uh, Remington wasn't really interested in having two competing designs under its own development simultaneously. So Lee ended up being attracted away by the Sharps Rifle Company, which at the time was being run by none other than Hugo Borchardt. So Sharps actually did the initial production, um, the initial tooling and design work and prototypes on this, the, what became the Remington Lee magazine rifle. Uh, the Navy was interested, the Navy checked them out, and uh, decided to order 300 of them. This was in 1879, hence the name, Model 1879 or 1879 Pattern Rifle. Unfortunately for Lee, the Sharps Company went bankrupt in October of 1880. This was kind of be going to become an ongoing thing. So at that point, the receivers had been made but not finished. They were in a partial state. And Lee ended up going back to the Remington Company. By this time, the Remington Keen rifle had also been expelled from military trials and rejected. And Remington was more interested in working with this gun again. So uh, the Remington Company took these 300 partially finished receivers from Sharps. They completed them into the first 300 rifles uh, adopted by the U.S. Navy. And this is actually one of those original 300 rifles. This is, in fact, number 276 of 300. So ultimately, this was the basis for the entire line of British Lee Enfield rifles. That's the same Lee, um, as well as a whole series of U.S. military Remington Lee rifles. Very cool, and this is, in fact, the very first version of them. So why don't I bring the camera back here, and let's take a closer look at some of the details to this rifle. We can look at how it differed from the later patterns and from the Lee Enfield that most of us are familiar with today. All right, a couple things we should note about this rifle to begin with. First off, the magazine has been updated by the Navy. That was done in 1884 or thereabouts. Let's take a look at the magazine first, because this is really the heart of this system. So, this is what was called a Lee Cook magazine. This was the second pattern of magazine formally used. The very first pattern was the, uh, the Lee Borchardt. Now, Lee came up with the idea for the magazine. Borchardt came up with the effective way to manufacture them, which was to take two stamped halves and braze or solder them together. If we look really close, right up here at the nose, and right back here, you can see that the two pieces overlap. That's how these were manufactured, and that was uh, Hugo Borchardt's idea. Now, the original magazines had a little hump coming out of the front. You'll see that the feed lips on this magazine are only at the very back. What, what the original magazines, this little hump, you would actually push the nose of the top cartridge in there, and that, combined with a little bit of a hook on the rim of the cartridge, would hold it in place. Unfortunately, this didn't really work very well. Uh, cartridges tended to fall out of the magazine 
while you were carrying the magazine outside the rifle. And so it was updated to the Lee Cook magazine. Cook uh, was an employee at Remington, and he came up with the idea of this little riveted detent. What that does, when I, put, I, I would put some rounds in the magazine, so the follower's not at the top, and then I push this detent up, and I have a little tab that comes out at the top. That holds on top of the top round, and that was enough to keep the rounds from falling out of the magazine. Now, if you're familiar with the Lee Enfield, you may be saying to yourself, why is this a big deal? You know, with Lees, you only get one magazine and you keep it in the gun, right? Well, not with the Remington Lees. These rifles were actually issued with four separate magazines. Uh, sailors, the, the web gear that went with this gun had a belt that would hold four of these magazines as well as a hundred loose cartridges. So you did, in fact, need to retain cartridges in the magazine when they were outside of the rifle. One of the elements we will see, because this detent requires this extra raised area, there has to be a cutout for it in the magazine well of the rifle. Not all of these original 300 Navy rifles were converted to use this type of magazine, but most of them were, and the ones that were had this cutout added. You can see that that cutout is rather larger than is necessary for the magazine. That's because these were pretty much done by hand. It was only after the initial 300 rifles, frankly much later in contract, when they started using these magazines regularly. And then they had a factory jig for cutting that notch. As a result of the conversion, these Navy rifles could use either the Cook or the Borchardt style of magazine. Anyway, oh, and the one other element is, you may also notice that as long as this tab is up, that's going to prevent a cartridge from actually coming out of the magazine. Well, they thought about that. This rivet its function, in addition to letting you manually engage it, it also impinges on the magazine well of the gun, and when I fully seat the magazine, that rivet is pushed down, which disengages the tab and allows you to feed a cartridge. Now, while we're looking at the magazine well, you'll see if I remove the magazine, this little blade pops out. That is in there to make it simpler to single load the rifle without a magazine. When I put the mag in, it pushes that blade back into a little cutout in the side of the receiver. All right, now another feature. There's a hood over the front of the receiver here. That serves to act as a guide when you're closing the bolt, which isn't really that big a deal. Its practical effect is when you're opening the bolt with a fired case, that angled surface forces the bolt backwards as you lift the handle, which helps extraction. That was a feature on these early Lees. The downside of that is it actually covers the very front bit of the magazine, making it impossible to use this rifle with a stripper clip or charger clip. Of course, those hadn't really quite been invented yet, so that wasn't all that big of a deal. Uh, I am not going to take the bolt out of this rifle because I'm a little bit nervous to do so. The factory manual for disassembly states that in order to take the bolt out, you actually take a screwdriver, wedge it into this little slot, and then pry it forward or back, which serves to push the extractor spring here forward off of its retaining hook, and then this spring and the extractor both come off of the bolt, and the rest of the bolt can slide out the back of the rifle. That's how it's done. But you know what? I don't want to be the guy who accidentally snaps the spring on this, so I'm going to leave it alone. Also worth noting that on this gun, it is a cock on close action, just like all successive Lees. It's also worth noting that the bolt handle is here inside the receiver. Uh, the bolt handle actually is acting as one of our locking lugs, along with a second lug down below it. Thanks for watching, guys. I hope you enjoyed the video. I hope you learned something. This is certainly a really cool, very rare US Navy marked uh, 1879 Remington Lee. So if you'd like to add it to your own US Marshall rifle collection or any other type of collection you have, go ahead and check the link in the description text below. That will take you to Rock Island's catalog page, where it is, of course, coming up for sale in uh, the beginning of September. So and take a look at their pictures and description, set up an account place a bit online or come down here to Rock Island in person and participate in the auction. Thanks for watching.